All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this session of the 2022 Smart Start Conference. While we were not able to host the Smart Start Conference in person this year, we are certainly glad and thankful that we have an opportunity to share the content with you virtually. Before we get this presentation started, we're going to ask you to make sure that your microphones are muted to ensure that we're able to hear our speakers um, clearly. And we are recording um, for those who haven't been able to join the session, so wanting it to be clear for them as well. Um, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our presenters. Um, with us this afternoon, we have Jill Gunderman and Nicole Parks, who will be presenting on forging equitable learning partnerships to strengthen early learning systems. And so I'm going to turn it over to them and they can introduce themselves and uh, start with our presentation. Thank you, ladies. Nicole, you're on mute. Well, that was just the most beautiful greeting that you have ever heard. Of course it was because you could not hear it. Um, but thank you so much, Lakeisha, um, for introducing us and Eric for your support as well behind the scenes. Um, and as always, it's lovely to dance with my amazing colleague and friend, Jill Gunderman. And welcome everyone in the room. It's such a wonderful treat to get to have a conversation with you today. And so we're just looking forward to getting started um, because we are not um, in a room together. We will have today's conversation in a slightly different way. And so we do want to invite you to use the chat feature um, to chime in, to let your voice be heard and to add your wisdom to today's conversation, because that is exactly what today is. Um, it is an opportunity for Jill and I to get to exchange wisdom and to learn with and from you. Um, so welcome again. We hope that you enjoyed today's conversation. Um, and we'd like to start by just inviting everyone to just take a moment and to just take a nice deep breath. So often during the day, we are doing all the things that we do to support children and families and our fellow team members. And oftentimes we just don't have a moment where we remember to breathe. And so we know that as we take that deep cleansing breath in and release it out and allow our shoulders to just kind of relax, it gives us an opportunity to notice and honor where we are in space and what's happening for us and also to become fully present um, with those who are with us. Um, and we would love for you to introduce yourself via chat if you would like to do so. Um, tell us your name and perhaps you know where you are in your role. Um, my name is Nicole Parks. I am the Director of Programs at Leading for Children. Currently, I am in a hotel room in Baltimore, Maryland, because I'm also um, presenting and attending the Head Start Conference, National Head Start Conference. However, I live in Sherwood, Arkansas, and joining me is Jill. And Jill, would you like to introduce yourself? Happy to, Nicole. Thank you so much for inviting me to hang out with you today. Um, my name is Jill Gunderman. I live in the northwest corner of Arkansas. Um, Fayetteville, Arkansas is where I live. And um, I am a contractor with Leading for Children. And my full-time job, I work for Arkansas State University Childhood Services, and we provide coaching and technical assistance and training throughout um, Arkansas on the, for providers, for um, infant toddler preschool providers, as well as school age as well. And so I am tickled to be with you today. It is storming here in Fayetteville, um, but I'd love to hear where else everyone is coming in from. Um, feel free to use the chat to tell us where you're at and what you do in your work. Thank you, Jill. And as we're preparing to do that, perhaps now is a great time to pass it to you and let's find out. Perhaps the poll could help us with that. So if you would, um, on your screen, you'll notice the poll, and we're just curious to hear 
who all is represented today. And of course, we know that the early learning field um, and ecosystem is so broad, we could never truly name all the roles that we have. So please forgive us if there is one that you represent and we haven't indicated that here. And if we did leave someone out, if you could tell us what that role is in the chat, we'd really appreciate it. Nicole and also noticed that in the chat, um, Alicia has commented that she um, is located in the beautiful North Carolina mountain town of Boone, North Carolina. And she works at the Children's Council of, I wanna pronounce it correctly, what a, what a Watataga. Thing? Watataga. Okay, thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that. Uh, Watataga County. So I am a two in a mountain town. And Robin writes that she, Robin Lockhart Jackson is kaleidoscope facilitator, family outreach specialist of Yadkin County. Did I say that correct? Hopefully. Yes. Thank you. So it looks like our poll is at 58%. Um, so if we give it maybe another two or three seconds, and then we can see our results. Looks like we've got everybody. I think so. Um, so Eric, if you could share the results. Okay, um, so it looks like majority of us today are either program support staff or we support families. So that is wonderful. And Jill, can I pass it to you as we continue our conversation? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, Nicole and I, like Nicole said, it, today is truly going to be a conversation. I think um, with each of us sharing the different perspectives that we bring to the room by as a program support staff members, as coaches, as um, people that work with families and supporting them, um, we each have our lived experiences um, and the wisdom that we all bring to the conversation. And um, I often like to quote Nicole that she likes to say that famous quote quote that iron sharpens iron. And so that will be kind of what we'll be doing today in our conversations. So I'd like for, to invite you to think for just a minute. Think about um, what is it that you'd like to get from today, from our conversation? And when you looked at the conference program and you picked this session, this is the one that I want to attend. What was it that made you go, yeah, that's the one that I want to go to and here's why. And take a moment, just jot that down for yourself. Think about it and write that down on your hand hand out. Um, what's something that you'd like to get from today? By thinking of that, holding that in your head, and then the act of writing it down, it helps us all act with intention, make our decisions in the way we choose to show up with intention. Um, and so it's a practice that um, really um, helps me move my practice forward. It helps me move my thinking forward. And so to that end, let's think also around what is it that we want for young children? At the end of the day, we're all here on behalf of young children. And so if you would be willing to share something that, that you think about when you think about your work and what is it that you want for young children that you work, um, that you work with or on behalf of? Feel free to use the chat to put that in there. We'd love to lift some of that out. Um, or if you're willing to come off of mute and share with us your insights, What's something that you want for young children. Well, in Watauga County, we're working to, with our community partners to build a, um, for lack of a better term, a continuum of care for young children beginning at birth and even prenatally. Mm -hmm. That when children are born into our community, we're there as a community to welcome them, which we do through our Family Connects program, but also that when children need additional support, um, that it's easily found in our community, that there's something for every family, every child, 
um, to have that kind of great start in those first years of life, which are, of course, as we know, are so important. Um, and so that's part of our prevention strategy. It's just, uh, we're a small enough community. We've got 1800 kids under the age of five that almost feels like you could do something for every single child. <laughs> and so that's, that's what we're about doing. And so um, as far as why I'm here, that whole uh, description about, I think it was in the session of the optimistic leadership and the connection of systems. It's something that we uh, work on here. We have a local early childhood initiative that we run that is about that. And that's what we're doing. We're building out that continuum of care and that system in our community. Thank you for that, Alicia. That continuum, I'm holding on to that. Well, and we and it's important to note that when we take care of kids that young, we also take care of the grown-ups who take care of them. So that continuum is about parents and caregivers and guardians and families and early childhood professionals. It, it covers the gamut of who's taking care of kids. Absolutely. Um, and Jill, on that note, and then I'd love for us to circle back to what we want for children. Let's take a moment because Alicia, what you said, it made me think about the objectives and the goals that we set for today. So Jill, um, if you can advance the slide. So um, here are, here's what we hope to have happen as a result of today's conversation. One is that we really think about how the five commitments of optimistic leadership can help us to forge respectful, equitable relationships to support positive child outcomes. And connected to what you said, Alicia, is that this is really about how we are with each others as adults and how that impacts outcomes for children. Um, and then we want to examine how change is already happening among the adults in the child's ecosystem to create more equitable systems. And then also do a little exploration of how, the, how Leading for Children's approach of the uh, learning network and using the five commitments is really promoting equal representation of voices across diverse early learning ecosystems really especially focusing on the realm of programmatic decision making. So again, it's about what happens among and with the adults in the child's ecosystem. And Jill, can I pass it back to you for us to, I, I hope that gives us some context as we're thinking about what we, what we want for children. Thank you. And I love that um, Alicia offered that thinking about adults and the system and then that word ecosystem as, as we think about supporting young children. So we were, we were imagining what are the things that we want for children in our work? What are those, some of those things? I'm curious if anyone else feels, feels willing to come off of mute or to put into the chat. Um, what is it that you imagine? What is it that you're wanting for young children? As people are thinking, I'd share one, Jill. I think what I would want most for every child is to really know that they are enough, to have that sense of self and of agency and confidence and trusting their own competence so that they just know that they are enough. And oh, that's powerful. That's really powerful, Nicole. And I'm thinking about the power of that and the ripples that creates in our community. Um, I am the mom of three and my middle child is getting ready to graduate high school. And so as she's getting ready to stand on those legs, you know, sturdy in her decision-making, spread her wings and fly, that idea that she's enough. And I'm thinking about how that starts on those early, early, early years, um, definitely. Yeah, Robin said to have access to learning and be supported by the adults around them. And I really appreciate, Robin, the S that you have on the, on the word adult, that it's not on the shoulder of one adult, but it really is on the, on the shared shoulders of all the adults in the child's ecosystem. Definitely. 
Well, these are some of the drivers that we're gonna um, drive our conversation this afternoon and keep us moving in this thought. Um, Nicole, you wanna share this next slide for us or this um, next quote? Yes. So as we think about the things that we want for children, so um, confidence, competence, you know, Robin said access to learning and support. You know, this quote by Marion Wright Elderman is hard to be what you can't see. If we want children to really to be able to see these things, to have these things, to embody these things, we are their first role models. What children learn, what they live and not what we say. So in order for them to see themselves, Jill, I think about you sharing about, um, you know, your middle daughter's um, graduation and her standing on those legs. And if she wants to feel strong and confident and capable, she first has to see you being mm -hmm strong and competent and able to see what that looks like. And so it's so important that some of the common things we say we want for children is safety, um, strong, healthy relationships, you know, wellness, all of these things. Well, it is so vital that the adults in their mm -hmm. ecosystem have access to those things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be curious to hear what people think about this idea that equity for every child must begin with the equity with equity for all the adults in their lives. And so if you'd like to use the chat feature or perhaps come off a of mute, we'd love to hear your what stands out as important to you about either the quote by uh, Marion Elderman or the idea of equity for children starting with equity for adults. Well, for some reason, my chat is not working, but when I read that, I think that's the first time I've ever seen that statement. Equity for every adult must begin with equity for all the adults in their lives. And I just want to say, duh, <laughs> but I've never seen it, nor have I thought of, I know I've just not thought about that, but that is true. It is truth is what it is. It's powerful. Yeah, and oftentimes, and, and I think one of the thing is we are, we are evolving as an ecosystem. And because we care so deeply for children, it's only natural to begin to always think about what children need and what's, you know, what they deserve. And oftentimes we forget that in order for them to get those things, we have to pay attention. And we have to make sure that the adults in their, in their lives have access to the same things um, so that they can, we can show up as our best selves for children. So Jill, if you want to um, advance. And so one of our convictions at LFC is that, that equity and excellence for young children can only truly exist when early learning systems prioritize equity for the adults who care for, support and educate them. And that's all of us, whether we are a teacher, a director, family child care provider, a family member, maybe we work um, at the state level, um, maybe we are a coach or we provide professional learning, no matter what we do, we in some way care for, support, and educate children. And equity and excellence for children begins with equity and excellence for us. And that's really important that we begin to recognize and understand that. You know, when we dream of what we want for children, we dream of these beautiful relationships and interactions. Um, Jill, if we go to the next slide, we dream of these spaces where children can be safe and that it's respectful. And going to the next slide, we dream of learning experiences that are exploratory and meaningful. And then do we think about the interactions between the adults in the lives of children, thinking about spaces, 
sometimes we, let's go to the next slide. Sometimes we go and we see these beautiful classrooms and then we walk into the offices, maybe sans the sleeping person underneath the desk, but oftentimes we have these very beautiful and respectful classrooms. And then we walk into the adult spaces that are oftentimes cluttered, um, maybe not aesthetically as pleasing. And so it's very important that we pay attention to that. And then thinking about learning experiences as we go to the next slide, how are we interacting and learning together as adults, right? We're ever growing, we're ever, ever learning. And if children deserve meaningful, exploratory and actionable learning experiences, we as adults, we deserve those same things. Because again, children learn what they live and not just what we say. And so one of the strategies or tips that we want to offer today is notice the parallels in your environment. Take a look around, walk around your space. If you're a family member, maybe that's around your home, maybe it's around your office. Um, if you're working inside an early learning setting, maybe it's in the center, maybe it's in the family childcare home, walk around your setting and ask yourself, how does this space, this environment support children? And then take a moment to notice and how does it, it support the adults? And notice if the same intent, um, consistency, level of care is given to the space of adults. And the great thing is we can do that now. So the answer isn't to go, oh, look at how cluttered the adult spaces are in contrast to the children's spaces to say, oh, so let us go and make this space more comfortable for the adults as well. And in the chat, Robin says, I agree with both statements. Children find their strength in the people around them. Absolutely, absolutely. So I wanna pause right there for a moment. And Jill, can I pass it to you? Yes, please. Thank you, Nicole. So we're going to continue thinking um, along this, this path, but I'd like to pause and invite you to either come off of mute or to put it into the chat. But when you hear the word leader, what comes to mind for you? What are some words that you associate with that word leader? Mm. Kim writes, making sure that everyone has what they need. The leader is that caretaker. Noticing and supporting those needs. Thank you for that. Mm. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole mentions a model. Back to that idea that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to share leaders to me are individuals who are given an opportunity to share their expertise in whatever area that may be. So that will change from time to time. It just depends on what it is that they're able to do and able to share. Mm, thank you for that, Angela. I'm holding on to those words, expertise, and given an opportunity. I'm thinking about that too. And then the fluidity of that, the changing of that. Thank you. Linda writes that someone who others want to follow. Mm. And Taylor writes, empathetic, knowledgeable, consistent growth mindset. Thank you for these. Lots of things that we're thinking about around this word leader. All these things we hold in our head, in our roles, um, supporting children and adults in the, in, in the um, children's lives. And so we're thinking about at um, Leading for Children, this definition of an optimistic leader. It's one that's de defined as um, leadership is how you see yourself, your willingness to recognize and own the impact you have on others and your commitment to take action to affect positive change. And so I am curious from you, I noticed in the chat, but chat, 
box that Robin says strength, power, guide, and example. More words to add to that collective definition of leader. And I'm curious to learn from each of you, as you look at this quote, what stands out to you as something significant or important? And if you're willing to either come off mute, share with us that word or phrase, or put it in the chat box and I'll be happy to read it out. But what is it about this, this definition of leadership that, that strikes you? Um, I believe for me, reading that may, means that you, it, someone that's going to be a leader has to recognize those gifts and talents in themselves, and also that everything that they say and they do is impacting someone else. And if you want to be a leader, uh, you know, there, there can be good leaders and there can be people leading people astray. So what you want to do is, you know, when you want to make change, it's really you know, if, if you're leading something and you've got to, you know, if you can stand up and some people can just get anybody to follow and, and behind them. And so, um, but again, we think about leaders in this way. I'm thinking about it very much in a positive way, but I also know that there are many, plenty of people with leadership skills that use it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Linda. Appreciate your willingness to share that insight. Um, but that, that how you see yourself and and knowing that the, 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 the weight of the impact that comes with a leader, you know, and, and, and those consequences of that. Taylor writes in the chat box, the self-reflection -reflect, aspect stuck out the most for me. So definitely that willingness to kind of continue to self-reflect and think about that. Yeah. I'm always too amazed um, that I noticed no one said anything about role or title. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you really think about it, we are all leaders for children. Each and every day um, we lead. And as an optimistic leader, that means understanding, mm -hmm. understanding that the decisions that I make, the words that I use, the choices um, each day have an impact for children. Um, and really recognizing and owning that. Um, because as we continue to build this story and think about this idea of forging equitable learning partnerships in a way to strengthen early learning systems, a lot of times we want to ask what well, whose responsibility is that? And the reality is, it's all of our responsibility. Um, you know, it, it's not about my title per se, it is about my willingness to own the impact that I have and to really be mindful of the way in which I am with others each and every day um, in my decisions to move us closer to the goal that we have. Thank you for that. Nicole, I'm thinking about that when you said no, not a role, because when you revisit this after that, you're like, yeah, that leadership, that can be anybody. And we all are. Yeah, and I think it's recognizing that in each other. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about um, my time as a teacher and as a director, um, you know, some of the most impactful, most of the most effective things that we did was when we all worked together, when, when family members, teachers, administrators, board members, community members, when we all came together and not just sit in a room together, but really listen to each other's wisdom and ideas and build on them and work together. That was when we did some of the most amazing things for young children. Mm. 
So I am thinking about how you noticed and pointed out to us, it's our willingness to, to um, own our impact that we have in the work that we do as a leader. And I'm thinking about how that connects to our second strategy of having these inclusive conversations. You know, um, it's one thing to have spaces for adults to come together. It's another thing for me to choose how I show up in that space and my willingness um, to have those type of conversations. Um, and I'm thinking about the power of having conversations and inviting people to think about what being a leader for children means for them. You know, what does that look and feel like for them and for them to identify and, um, and to articulate what that thing is. Um, and I'm thinking about in the systems in which we work, by each of us having that conversation within that agency, how much stronger will we leave that conversation by having a, a, an idea of what our colleagues mean? Yeah, and that makes me think too, Jill. When we, when we talk about inclusive conversations, we often say this is the difference between bringing voices to the table and inviting voices to co-create the table. Mm. And so truly inclusive conversations is more than saying, I can check off the different boxes of who should be represented. It's when these voices come together in equal footing, um, sharing equal space, and there is not a hierarchical power structure where we all come in and roles and titles begin to blur and it is the wisdom and the voices of each person. Um, because one of the things that we believe is that all children deserve the opportunity to thrive. Mm -hmm. And in order for that to happen, every adult must embrace their critical role as a leader um, and the role that they play in ensuring that children can grow up in these communities where they feel safe and secure. And if we go back to this idea that we talked about earlier um, about parallels, in order for adults to make children feel safe and secure, those adults themselves must feel safe and secure. And so that's a very important ingredient when we talk about inclusive conversations. It's not enough to just invite the voices, it's ensuring that the space truly invite the voices in, in safety and security and comfort um, where they can help co-construct the table and also decide, be a part of deciding the goals and the visions that's going to occur and the plans to get there as a result of everybody being around the said table. So um, in the picture that you see, this is from one of our learning networks in Mississippi. And this is a blend of roles. We have van drivers, kitchen managers, directors, teachers, community members, um, family members, and they're working together um, in smaller teams within the learning network. Um, and one of the things that they were doing um, is that they were talking about, they were determining together some critical pieces um, of best practice for children, what children need. And so if you notice the picture, there's a lot of smells and you can see they're being silly together because inclusive conversations say we all should be here and we're here in the context of reciprocal and mutual respect um, and listening to each other's voices. Looking at this photograph, Nicole, I'm noticing the energy. Mm. Lots of, lots of, lots of energy. Okay. So I just want to, should we do a little check-in to see if 
before we go to our first set of breakout rooms, if, if there's anything that anybody would like to say or share or add either coming off of mute or in the chat box. Okay, if not, we'll go to the next slide. So what we'd like to invite you to do is we're getting ready to go to breakout rooms. And what we'd like, let's, I'll, what we're going to ask you to come back out with is each group with a headline. Um, so you might want to, I think we're small enough, Jill, where we won't even need the Google Doc. In your breakout room, you can decide who's going to be your scribe. And when they come back and, sh and you all share, one person could share and somebody else could uh, type your headline in the chat. Here's a very important piece, the way in which the conversation unfolds. So in your small group conversations, we're going to invite you to use what we, leading for children's carousel technique. And the technique is very simple, um, yet it is so critical when we talk about equitable voices and inclusive conversations. So we're going to offer you a prompt and we're going to invite you when you first get in your room to take a moment to think and jot down your thoughts. It doesn't have to be poetry, doesn't even have to be paragraphs, but just jot down a few things for yourself. And then everyone will go around the virtual room and each person introduce yourself to each other and then read only what you wrote. And I'll say the, the natural tendency is going to be either to explain what you read um, and trust, remember, confident, competent agency, trust yourself, or to say, well, somebody else said what I was going to say, so I'm not going to say anything. Even if someone said what you said, your wisdom, your as a result of your lived experiences, your knowledge, just your presence in your being, even if you've said the same thing, you saying it in your own unique way is going to deepen and strengthen understanding. So I invite you to trust that as well. And then after everyone has read um, what they said, have a conversation and then come to a consensus on what you want to share back in the form of a headline. And again, we're not saying that it has to be poetry. Um, this is a strategy and a way to explore, com ex explore con a um, concept. And so on your documentation handout, if you have it, um, and I just thought about that, if people don't have it, but if you look under number three, you're going to see where we say system change begins with equity, where there is respect for each individual and the wisdom they bring is honored, listened to, and used to support inclusive decision-making. And if you look right to the right side of that, there is a call out box and it says, oh, I don't know what happened. We believe that because systems are comprised of people, transformative relationships must drive systems change. Systems get stronger when the people within them at every level are deeply motivated to think and work in new ways on behalf of a larger vision, a vision of quality and exemplary practices for children and families. And here's the prompt. We want to invite you to go into your breakout rooms. Thank you, Lakeisha just put the link um, in the chat box if you don't have it. We want to invite you in your breakout room to just take a moment and read those two things and what stands out as important to you. And think about that, jot it down, have a carousel, and then together, come to a consensus, which means have a back and forth conversation. What's the thing that you want us to remember? What's that important thing 
you want us to remember about systems change and relationships based on what you read and what was important to you. So if, are there questions about what we're asking you to do? I'm waiting to see. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we, the, the um, instructions are now in the chat box. Um, we are going to, thank you, Ashley. We are going to say, let's take about 15 minutes because we really want you to be able to have a conversation. Jill and I will be available if there are any questions. Um, and again, the most important part is the conversation that you will have to delve deeper and not so much the headline you come back with. So please don't try to make it perfect. So with that being said, let's open the breakout rooms. You should start to see it. Jill, I'll set my timer. All right. Let's see. I think some people are still trying to get over. Let's see, are we needing... Would you like me to move anyone from the two-person group to a three-person group? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if... Um, well, we have a couple of people who haven't joined. I think that's what's creating the two-person. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, because I can't tell if Paulina and Michelle. Right. <laughs> okay. Yes, let's do that. But let me let me go in and ask first, sure. just to be respectful before we move. So, Jill, if you want to go in and check in with room two and see if they want to join another group, I'll do the same with room four. Okay. Okay.
Okay, Eric, yes. So group four would like to go into rooms with some other people. Okay, I'll put four in three. Okay. And now I'll wait to hear back from Jill. Thank you. Certainly. I'm going to just go check in on group one and two, just no three, because she's in one, just to see if they need anything. Okay. I'll be back. Right. They, I checked in with room two, Angela and Vanessa, and they were content to stay where they were. In fact, I interrupted them. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so they are good. And I will leave it be. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll let it alone. Thank you again, Lakeisha, for putting that in the chat box. I had I had failed to have a copy of my handout myself. And when Nicole mentioned that, I went, oh no, where's that? And you had it there. I was like, whoo, so glad, I'm grateful. Um, how was that group? They were fine. I, our du my duo were, were content. Okay, I am going to just kind of check in with room three. Um, I just came out of room one and they are rocking and rolling and are doing just fine. How are we on time? Because you set your timer, but I did not set I mine. did. We have a little over seven minutes left. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Hey, Angela. Um, the group is currently in breakouts. Um, so we can put you in one if you'd like. I think they only have maybe five more minutes. So you can okay, I can wait. Yeah, I feel comfortable waiting out here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would y'all like me to broadcast any three minute left messages or anything? Well, um, group three is really just getting um, started. Some of them couldn't access the handout. So let's give them, <clears throat> Jill, what do you think? Maybe five minutes? Sure. Okay. Because really they have four, four and a half minutes left kind of, so five. So Jill, because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the ladies in group one was sharing that because she came in late, she kind of needed a, exactly where are we? So we may want to, after we hear some, before we go to the next piece, we may want to just kind of do a recap of the story. I forgot we were recording, will you all, can you all edit this? Okay, thank you. I forgot all about that. Sorry. Um, oh yes, this whole chunk will get. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But we can let's do a little recap so they feel grounded and you know can feel secure for the rest of the conversation. That's great. I think that's a great idea. And we end at three, correct? Okay, three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Just. Confirming since I'm in a different time zone. <laughs> I didn't change my uh, computer, so my computer still has Arkansas time. So when we come back, we'll hear some, do a recap, and then go into the five commitments and show the video, answer some questions, and then hold space for the raffle. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, they have like right at two minutes left, I think. <clears throat> when I hit close rooms, they've got one more minute. It's a minute to close the room. Okay. 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 So Good I guess know. maybe broadcast to let them know rooms will be closing in about one minute. I know group three will be just really getting their conversation. I think they'll be okay. Um. And I think you're right, Jill. Let's we'll do the Alabama video like after this piece. <clears throat> okay.
Ready to hit close. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I get so annoyed with myself when I click on the leave room instead of just hide the breakout room is ending soon. And I just, <laughs> and I was mid sentence too. <laughs> to click it and talk at the same time. Oh, I want to go back to my group and say, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sometimes those buttons get us. You don't have that ever happen, Eric. Your brain and oh, your. Yeah. Oh, I do it all the time. Oh, you do. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, this is the first time, one of the first times I've done the breakout room. So I was looking if there's a way I could put you back in, but there's not. Oh, oh, I see. Thank you. I thought you were like, hmm, never. Heard. Oh, no, that happens a lot. I know I do it. You do. <laughs> I actually ended a meeting one time. So. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> That button looks so good. I just have to click it. Oh, it says end meeting. Whoops. <laughs> Come back. So we're curious to hear um, whatever you would like to share with us. Um, and we'd like to start with, and I will, and let's say to you, if there's a group who says, I just really want to pass, then we can pass to and just know that we will all be richer in knowledge because of your wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with group one. That was Ashley, Denise, and Samantha. Is there anything that you would like to share with us? Yes, well, Denise gets all the credit for this, oh. but, and we were like, oh, how are we gonna make this a headline? Cause it's so big. And I guess that was the point of the practice was to drill it down, but still encompass the idea. But um, Denise asked a question, so I'm gonna turn it into, her question was, are we actually asking and finding out what other people need? Because I know we act with great intent and love, but sometimes we're missing the mark because we're not, you know, so I think we decided, um, ask or, or be curious ask the questions listen then act wow thank you group one um way to go on collaborating um this is this is the beautiful thing so ashley you said i'll we give credit all credit to denise and denise put those lovely words together for us in a question and it was all of the wisdom in the room and the idea that you all had this inclusive conversation that really allowed you all to raise this to the top so thank you for that um and let's see let's go to group two angela and vanessa i believe it was i think vanessa took notes if she doesn't mind sharing out for us okay Oh, sure. Thank you, Vanessa. So um, our headline would be transformative and deeply motivated. Mm. Transformative and deeply motivated. Wow. Thank you for that group too. What I always appreciate about this, this strategy is the, even though the headlines cause us to have to drill down and be crisp, but yet it's so much depth and complexity and comprehensiveness to what you all come back with. And so um, thank you for that. And 
Let's turn our attention to group three, which was Amy and Kim, Linda, Mara, and Robin. Well, we had a lot of similar ideas, so I'm going to volunteer myself here. Um, I said, and we went in, I listened to some uh, what the others were saying, and I kind of condensed it together, and, and I put transforming lives through equity, inclusion, and building relationships. Mm. Equity, inclusion, and building relationships transforming lives. Wow. What I appreciate about that is it goes back to the parallel that we talked about, about children and adults, right? Mm -hmm. That if these are the things that we want for children, these are the things that we have to make sure that we have for the adults in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, wow, we appreciate that so much. Um, you know, and so much of this element without using the word, there is so much about trusting that the people within the system have the wisdom and know what they need. You know, from are we asking, um, you know, are we being inclusive? All of the things that you all said, it speaks to that trust. And so, so often we have to remember that that um, the idea of it comes from, and I do agree with, I believe it was maybe Ashley who said that, that it comes from the great intent mm -hmm. and with a great heart. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember the importance of making sure that we are being diverse in the voices that we're listening to and that the voices that's really driving the systems change are the voices of the people who the system, who are within the system, who the system is meant to serve. Um, so let's, we're, we're going to watch a video, but before we do, um, Jill, if you could share your power, our PowerPoint again, because we'd like to offer the third tip or strategy. Um, if we go to the next one, I think. Here we go. There we go. And that is let's use tools to support ongoing conversations that create consensus. And so we did that in several ways. One was the, the method that we use, um, asking you to have this conversation and drill it down to a headline um, to get to the core of it that created a space where you had to create consensus through conversation. And also that we offered the prompt, you know, in terms of, of, the, of the quote. So that's another tool. And then I want to invite you to think about the carousel technique in itself. So when we say everyone stop and think, go back to the parallel of what we want for children to be able to be thinkers, critical thinkers. And then we say, read what you wrote. And it's not because we wanna limit your words, it's so that every voice gets equal weight, um, that it's not based on role, title, anything like that other than every voice gets equal weight. And then let's connect on each other's idea and have a conversation. And then let's build consensus, let's decide together. And that's that difference between bringing voices to the table and bringing voices together to co-construct the table. And so that's another strategy that we'd like to offer. Um, you can use quotes, you can use photos, you can use videos. There are so many ways that you can use tools um, and the methodology um, processes to create consensus. And so we wanna show you a video from our learning network in Alabama. And it's a really short video, but this is when we, because we're going to talk next, Jill is going to share with us about the commitments and a little um, about the learning network approach. And this is a design team. And so in Alabama, we, what they wanted to do was to create a library of videos that would support 
early educators across the state of Alabama um, in best practice. And they wanted to specifically do it for um, developmentally appropriate practice, interactions, coaching, and child assessment. And so what we said was, well, let's use our learning network approach. Rather than the experts come in and say, here's the script, here's what you need to say, here's what you need to do. We created this learning network of diverse voices, teachers, um, co-teachers, directors, coaches, regional directors, um, someone from some people from Institute of Higher Learning, all of these voices to come together, um, some representing families, so that they could co-construct what was important for them to be in the videos, that they could be a part of reviewing and saying yes, no, throughout the whole process. And so this is them talking about what what that process was like for them. So. Are you seeing the video screen? Okay. a very empowering process and it gave us a voice to share the knowledge that we have in our field and articulate why we do what we do how we do what we do you know show how to implement it and plan it assess it and that's something that we don't get a lot of chance to do it helped me realize that what i contribute is valuable to more than just the parents and the students that we interact I think this video project is going to be a success for years to come. And then the teachers will be able to use them to reflect in their own practices along with the coaches. I work with the pre-service teachers before they get out into the field. So having access to these videos and having access to your expertise has been wonderful for me to share with them. I want this learning network that we have created together to continue for all of us. And I hope that we will have the opportunity to extend beyond what we have begun here because it's epic. Stop sharing. Um, so just to, to really clarify, when Barbara talked about the expertise, she was not talking about us as the facilitators. She was talking about all of those educators and coaches um, and directors and all of the people that were in the room. Um, and she was actually, she, and she has continued to do that, to use the wisdom that they share to help shape how she is educating future teachers that's going through their teacher preparatory program. Um, <clears throat> so, Jill, can I turn it over to you uh, yes. to talk about the five commitments? And as she's pulling it up, one thing that this is, so how do we get here? How do we get there? So what you, what you saw was people together collaborating in warm relationships, working together in the product ended up being a nine nine or 12, I can't remember, video um, library that's on the Department of Ed. But what was holding it up behind that was the framework of the five commitments, um, the way that we embodied them as the facilitators and the way that the learning network members, as we introduced them, embodied them. And that is what really allowed this work to be successful and effective. So Jill, if you want to introduce those commitments. Those, these commitments, the five commitments of optimistic leaders. In thinking about, um, back to our earlier conversation around um, that leadership is something that we all can embody, that we all have a role in and play on behalf of children. Um, I think about these five commitments as being accessible to all of us too, that we all have the agency to choose 
how to use and show, show up with these. And so the first one that we're going to talk about is this think impact to make informed decisions. And again, I'm thinking back to you referenced it earlier, uh, Nicole, about what do we want for young children? We want them to think about their impact, right? And, and back to us saying that it's difficult for children to be what they can't see. And so we model that for our children, that think impact to make those informed decisions. Um, we cultivate self-awareness is the second um, um, commitment that we're thinking about um, to guide our thoughts, emotions, and behavior. So being curious about our own self-awareness and and what drives us and what motivates us and what annoys us. Um, I had a, a group meeting this morning and I left it kind of feeling a little irritated and, and, and you know, and sitting with that irritation to go, well, what was it about that interaction that I found off-putting? What was it in me and being curious and activating, you know, and kind of cultivating that self-awareness to so that then, then I can then act with intention the next time. Um, that awareness you, you know, you, 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 you got to name it before you can tame it. Right. Um, and so, so sitting with that a little bit, the third commitment, we're thinking about nurture relationships, nurture relationships to support that learning, that collaboration. We know the power of relationships in our work with young children. It's the driving force of that. Um, the thing for me about this commitment is that word nurture. It's more than just building. It's more than just sustaining, but it's that continuous of nurturing. I think about the plants that I'm attempting to grow as there's a monsoon happening outside right now with my little little flowers that I put in there. But what is it that I need to do to nurture that? Um, so thinking about that word. And then the, uh, the fourth commitment that we're thinking about is that refining that communication for mutual clarity and understanding. Um, again, I'm going to zero in on that word refine because for, to refine to me, conjures up this image of constantly recalibrating, dependent upon who I'm communicating, the purpose of the communication, but it's retuning it. So it just gets just right, that refining process. And then lastly, activating our curiosity um, to find connections and to continue learning. Um, but that staying curious, letting that curious be our, curiosity be, be our driver behind what we do. Um, and one of the groups shared earlier, and I wrote it down, because it meant something to me, and now I can't put my hands on it, of course. Um, but y'all had mentioned that idea of being curious, of not making those assumptions about what it is that the groups that we're serving need, but being curious for them um, to, to hold on to that and, and name that. But these five commitments, um, they, they drive our work. And so my invitation to you is to think about how these five commitments could support more equitable systems. Feel free if something jumps, jumps into your head to um, come off of mute and share that insight with us or to put that into the chat box about what you notice about these five commitments as you look at this graphic or as you look through these words. Ashley says empathy. Mm, powerful. I think so often about how the um, communication is inclusive of listening. I don't practice it as well as I, as much as I think about it, but it's so critical that we listen and that's really so key to communication. And then I think what really drives the clarity and understanding when you can force yourself to be quiet and listen, <laughs> listen to others, hear their stories, hear their experiences. And yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Amy. And connected to what you said, Linda as active listening, listening for understanding. So this idea, um, hearing their stories. So it's more than hearing the thing that we think need fixing. It's really nurturing the relationship and activating curiosity to get to hear their stories, to hear them, um, to hear their wisdom, their, their dreams, their hopes, and to really begin to refine communication and make decisions together that moves you towards a shared 
outcome and a shared vision. And it really can exist outside of relationships. And so, and, and one thing I often like to say about these commitments, there is no mastery. Um, Jill and I are both very much each and every day working to embody these commitments more and more. It starts with the commitment to the commitments. And if we can wake up each day and do that, that keeps us on that path. There will always be moments where we go back and we say, mm, that I just made a judgment with that person and I really should have activated my curiosity. Well, next time I'll do better. I'll say what in that moment caused me to fall back on judgment and let me use that knowledge so that in the next situation, I am curious and not judgmental. So it's really a practice. Anyone else? These five commitments for me, I love this image because they are really interwoven and braided in a way that they support and intertwine with each other. Um, but it's one of those, like Nicole said, that practice of trying to keep these in the forefront of my mind so that I can show up as the leader that I want to be um, and, and show up as the, as the professional that I want to be. And it, and it helps to keep like you said, when it when I, when I slip and I oops, it helps me get back up and try again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Jill, do you think we're ready to move forward? Yeah, let's do it, Nicole. Okay. Um, this is a, actually a colleague from Wyoming, um, Lauren Carlisle, introduced me to to the work of Priya Parker. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Don't tell me your values. Show me how you gather and I'll tell you your values. And it is what we strive to embody with the learning network model. And so it is the idea that if we truly believe in equity, we really believe that all voices matter. Not only do they matter, but they are an imperative um, for us to realize our goals of quality and excellence for all children. If we really believe that it is important that we prioritize the adults in the child's ecosystem, because we understand that healthy adults can better show up as they best selves for children. When we really begin to do this, it will show in the way that we gather. Mm. It will show in the way, not just bringing voices to the table because that's not enough. It is about how the voices are at the table, which is so Ashley mentioned the idea that you're getting to do the strategies that we're talking about. So it's ensuring that there's equity when it's at the, when people are at the table, right? Not only am I going, let me make sure there's not voices that's missing. Let me make sure that all of these voices have equal weight. Let me make sure that there is consensus building and shared decision making. Um, let me make sure that it is respectful for all. So the way that we gather, it shows us our value, not just the statements that we make or what we have written. Um, and so um, that's just something to throw out there. And Jill, I think we can move forward. Um, just a recap of our strategies that we shared as we've talked about, you know, really working so that we can forge these equitable learning partnerships to strengthen early learning systems. Notice the parallels in your environment. And remember, we're talking about all adults in the child's ecosystem, and we're talking about all environments. So whether that's your home as a family member, your office, maybe it's your early learning program, if you're a family child care provider, um, but notice the parallels in your environment. If there are children in your environment, how does it support children? And if they're not, how would it support children? 
and then think about now how is it supporting the adults and so one example that I use is I used to coach um, and I was co I was at a center and I was coaching a director and a teacher came in late and yes the teacher was late yes I know ratios have to be met and I just remember this director reaming this teacher mm. like right there in the office in front of about four of us just reamed her the teacher got teary um tried to explain why she why she was late director didn't want to hear it and so the teacher goes on into her room and she's like you know i need you to go into your room i have you know someone from the kitchen staff covering your room so later we're walking around as we always did when i would, would visit and i hear this teacher using a tone that I had never heard her use. I'd always known this teacher to be calm. And I heard her speaking a little roughly to the children. And the director was livid. And I said, let's go to your office. And she said, can you believe that? I am, I am so mad or something to that effect. And I said, yeah, I noticed that your button was pushed. Can you tell me what pushed it? And she's like, well, aren't you angry? And I said, I am a little frustrated. And she said, well, yeah, I said, I think we're a little frustrated with, with different people. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean? And I said, we can only give gifts to children that we have. I said, and whatever gift we have, that's the gift we give. I said, and this morning you gave that teacher a gift unintentionally. I said, you made her feel disrespected. You clearly talked over when she tried to tell you what happened. I said, you made it feel like her flat tire was not, your, not a big deal, like you didn't understand her frustration. You made her feel invisible and called out at the same time. I said, and what you just heard, I said, not that we're condoning it, what you just heard was what you gave her. And she said, hmm, I didn't think, I said, and I know, ratios have to be met. I said, but if you want your teachers to be able to go in the classroom and be calm, use a calm voice with children at all times. And she just kind of went, I should be using a calm voice with adults at all times. I went, mm -hmm, exactly. So notice the parallels in your environment. The other thing is to have inclusive conversations. And remember, not just bringing voices to the table, bringing voices together to co-construct the table. And then while you have them there, it's not just about the fact that you're together, it's how you are together. Use tools that elicit the group's wisdom and build consensus. Um, and remember, this is practice and not perfect. And definitely um, the five commitments internalized and shared as a group. So with the design team, with our learning networks in general, that's a, our five commitments are like our group agreements as well. And so um, let's see, Jill, is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Because there's a raffle. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about the words that you said practice, you know, and it's something that it's, it's, it's not a mastery to practice, but I think that for me connects that that equity isn't a one and done. It was, it's not a box to check. It's not a, oh yeah, we talked about that once in the summer of 1990, <laughs> whatever. No, it's a daily practice that we strive and continue to bring into the forefront of our mind um, to, to kind of um, strive for that. So um, oh, yay. Um, Ashley puts in the chat box, reflective practice begets reflective actions. Wow. A thought shared during a session yesterday from um, E. Flores. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, as we get ready for our raffle, we want you, and this is not to share with us, this is for you. But remember, we said this starts with your commitment to the commitments, to having these type of equitable, inclusive conversations. So think about a strategy that you're curious to explore. Remember, not try to get perfect, but to explore and jot that down somewhere for yourself so that you can remember that and revisit it. Um, and I am passing it. This is our contact information. We do hope that you keep in touch and we don't wanna get in the right way of raffle. 
So um, thank you so much for today. And I believe I am passing it. We are passing it to Lakeisha, I believe. Yes, thank you, Jill and Nicole, for sharing this presentation with us. Um, also, thank you to everyone for attending this presentation. We want to remind you to complete the survey for this session, and Eric has put the link in the chat box. Also, the reminder to complete the survey for the whole conference. Um, they are separate surveys, so complete, um, complete both of those. And we do have a raffle. Um, we uh, want to thank uh, Lakeshore Early Learning for our raffle prize today, which is a washable sensory ball. And the winner of our raffle is Robin from Yadkin County. So congratulations, Robin. If you could send me a message um, in the chat with your, your full name and your email address so we can contact you on how to get that to you. And so again, thank you everyone for your attendance. We hope that you are able to join us tomorrow morning for our um, our next session. And um, Eric, is there anything that I forgot? Nope, that should do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest Everybody. of the day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jill and Nicole. It was very nice meeting you. Nice Thanks, Sarah. You. Thanks, oh, Eric. Thanks, Lakeisha. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, don't. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down if uh, <laughs> I shall need anything. Okay. So long. Here. Bye. Bye. Bye.